Welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Bandit the Podcast. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Amy Butler. As we gain insights and hear stories straight from Working Preacher authors and about proclaiming an authentic word in changing times. And in this episode, I'm so excited to say we are we welcome Amy Butler. And the reason we are uh, having a guest extra interviewer is because our normal host, Caroline, we're talking about her latest book today. There it is, Caroline Lewis. I'm excited. I'm holding it in my hand, A Lay Preacher's Guide, uh, A Lay Preacher's Guide, How to Craft a Faithful Sermon. So um, Amy, I'm glad you're able to join us. Welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast. Thanks, Ralph, and thanks, Caroline. It's so great to be here with you, Caroline. I'm so excited to talk about your book. You know, I love preaching and talking about preaching, and um, thanks for having me. It is so great to have you here, Amy, and I am excited about talking about my book. But before we get to that, tell us a little bit about uh, where you where you are, what you've been up to, where are you joining us from, what's going on in your life. What do we need to know? <laughs> Thanks for asking. I am in DC and I'm currently the interim senior minister at National City Christian Church. That's the National Church of Disciples of Christ. And it sure has been interesting being a new pastor during pandemic, but I have loved this wonderful congregation. It's been a great place for me. In my free time, I'm working on a project called Invested Faith, which um, is growing steadily. It's super exciting. It's um, sort of born out of these new ideas we are invited to think about with the decline of the institutional church. And so it is a fund that allows churches at the end of their life cycles to create a legacy project that bridges from the traditional institution to social entrepreneurs. You know, you all have a lot of students who are not going into the parish which I think probably is related to your reason behind writing this book, Caroline, but um, they're doing interesting projects that are outside the stained glass walls and how can we get the assets of the institutional church to bear on the work that they're doing in the world? So it's exciting. That sounds great. Yeah, that is super exciting. Yeah, yeah, that's um, wonderful. Thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. So uh, Caroline, before we uh, jump uh, well, we can jump into your book, and um, my favorite part of the book is on page nine of the preface, where you say thank you to um, Rolf Jacobson and Ben Colton. <laughs> I just thought that was a really well-written sentence. I was hoping you would pick that up. Yeah, when, yeah. We, when, we, um, when we started these books, uh, Working Preacher Books, one of the, you know, we get together with our publisher and we, and we brainstorm uh, topics uh, that really are missing, titles that are missing. And uh, one of the ones was we have, because we do have so many churches that uh, can't afford um, seminary educated preachers. So there's a lot of lay preachers. And uh, so there was a need for this. And we asked Caroline to do it as the team and she did a great job. So thanks, Caroline. So on page 37, you write, we trust our voice because God does. Um, why is it hard for us to trust our voices as preachers? Well, I think the main reason is the act of preaching is, is putting yourself out there. I mean, you are, you are making a claim about the biblical text that, that people could uh, disagree with <laughs> or not like, uh, even though you even though theoretically that's supposed to be based on the biblical text, but nonetheless, there's a real, there's risk in it. There's risk in making a succinct and clear claim about God. And, and when we're doing that, that's, and then we think about, well, how is it that my voice and my, uh, my relationship with God then is also being, uh, put out there. I mean, you can't hide. We think we can, I think we can, I think we think we can sometimes hide behind these, uh, making these claims about God or making these claims about the text, but it, but we are revealing, uh, we're reveal, revealing who we are in, in this rhetorical act that we call, a, a, that we call a sermon. And so it, it, it's several things about trusting your voice. It's trusting that, that you, 
have a particular thing to say that this congregation needs to hear and really believing that and being clear about that, it's putting yourself out there, that claim out there, which is risky and takes some courage and a lot of, uh, a lot of support from the Holy Spirit. And it is, it's, it's, it's realizing that, yeah, people are going to find out something about what I think about God, what I think about this passage, as much as I might maybe want to hide behind it. So I think those are some of the things that are going on when, when I was writing that chapter of trusting your voice. Uh, it, how long, how long does it take? I mean, part, part of what uh, the concept of one's voice, I had my college writing teacher talked about this all the time. Um, and it took me, it took me years to find my voice as a preacher that I, I know you dedicate this to your parents who are preachers, I'm guessing for a while you're like, do I sound, should I sound like my dad? Should I sound like my mom? Should I sound like my favorite teacher? All those things went until I eventually did, I think, but it took me years. It does take a long time. It takes, it, it takes a long time to uh, distinguish your voice from others. And as you said, uh, Rolf, both of my parents uh, were our preachers. And uh, how is it that I am, I have a different voice, I have a different, and, and by voice, I mean, I, you know, it's not just the instrument, but it's, it's what's coming from your heart. Uh, how do you, I, how, what is your truth? How do you identify yourself uh, as what is your identity as a, as a person of God, as a child of God? And uh, that, that process takes time as you, as you are listening to others, but also as I think as a preacher, as you're doing it more and you are, uh, you're, you're not choosing to go in that direction or you're not choosing to go in that direction for your for a sermon you're you're trusting that this is the direction that you need to go and that just that just takes practice caroline i want to ask you about something you wrote at the very beginning of the book with such conviction and it's a question i've wondered about my whole career mm. and i i really want to know you wrote good preachers are not born they are made um, so I'm torn here. On the one hand, mm. I've taught so many preaching classes that I want to stab myself in the eye. And I, I, <laughs> I, I wonder if good preachers are actually made. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think we give enough attention to the craft of preaching and to practicing it. And so mm -hmm. I liked what you were saying, but I want to know, do you really believe this and why? Mm, mm. So do I really believe that that good preachers are made? Yes. Yeah. Well, you're right. I've had a few of uh, stab myself in the eye kind of moments as well. Uh, and, and when you're especially when you're teaching, beginning preaching, uh, I think that what I mean by that is there is this sense when particularly in beginning preaching that, uh, can I really do this? You know, is this really possible? Uh, and and it's, it's probably one of the most important things that, or I think it's one of, it's the most important thing we do as, as pastors and leading a congregation. But I think there's this initial disbelief that God really called me to do this uh, and in such, and claiming that kind of public voice. And so the, that resistance or that, that disbelief, that's, the, that's what's happening in the making. You know, it's like kind of, it's trying to convince them that yes, this is what God has called you to do. And, and but it does, I think, say, take some intention on the part of the, of the preacher to say, I'm really going to lean into this calling. And what does that what, what is that going to require of me? Uh, that it does require uh, it, uh, practicing a craft yeah. and it does require this, uh, th this, these elements of taking it apart. I, in my former life, I was a violinist. And so uh, you don't, you know, you, you have to practice a lot of things <laughs> to be able to play the violin and you take those things apart, right? You, you, I've got to work on my double stops. I've got to work on my vibrato. Uh, I, I need to, you know, I need, I need to work on my, on my scales for my intonation. And 
that's what I mean by making, but you got to do the work. You really right. have to do the work. It's a great reminder because we're never actually there. We have to mm -hmm. always keep, keep working at it, don't we? We do. And I, I think that's one of the things that is hard for preachers to get their heads around is that, it, is there a sense that you're going to arrive someday? No, you're not. I mean, it's just, it's, 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 it's a constant uh, uh, dedication to that craft and, and what needs some attention, you know, this time around, as opposed to another time around or what, and, and each text and each context is determining that. Uh, that, you know, again, like a piece of music, there's going to be a piece of music that's going to be, that's going to require me to really, really work on my double stops uh, to be able to play this. And so it's, it, that's, in, that's, it's not just dedication to your craft in general, which is true, but it's how each, it's how each biblical text and each moment in that context is also shaping I, uh, a attending that craft, if that makes sense. And maybe what is the most important thing you start off that uh, a faithful sermon is biblical. And so um, one thing is that uh, lay preachers might not, might feel a little intimidated at first. And so you, you, you lay out sort of a nice eight step process to go through. Although our, our beloved teacher, uh, Don Jewell, was a New Testament teacher for both of us. He had at the top of his list of steps to go through to interpret a passage. If this becomes basically a wooden thing, burn this document. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, which yeah. I think is a good reminder. Um, yeah. Sort of towards the end of those eight steps, um, you say, you know, consult experts, uh, consult the commentaries or, you know, online commentaries like we have on Working Preacher. Uh, why is it important, especially for new? lay preachers, maybe to really wait for a long time, do a bunch of other work with the text before they um, consult what an expert thinks? For me, it's two things. It goes back to the voice of trusting, of trusting their voice, trusting uh, their instincts when it comes to a biblical text. And so when we, when we start with the commentaries, there's a lot of chatter <laughs> then in your head about what this passage could mean. And, but it's only, it's only you, the preacher, who will have a sense of what this passage might mean for your particular congregation, your particular audience, your, your, the people who are listening to that. And so the commentaries don't know that context. And so it, that's the, that's the first thing. It's to trust that it's, it's, they're listening to you because you know what they need to hear. You, you know what they need to hear. Uh, you know what, what's on their hearts and what's on their minds. And you're the one that's been walking through them with them this week. And so that's what, that's what you trust when you're engaging the text. The second, so it's that voice. The second thing is for me, when it comes to postponing the commentary process is to trust the biblical text, uh, that, that to, to dive down into it, to drop into it and say, what puzzles me? What surprises me? What, what am I curious about? Because inevitably, it's that, it's that first reaction, right? That first impression of the text that ends up being that spark that turns into a sermon. And so uh, for me, it's, 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 it's trusting, what did the text do to you? How did you experience the text before you go and read all this stuff about the text? Uh, because a sermon is not about God. I mean, there's, you're making claims about God. You're making claims about God's activity in Jesus and God's activity in the Holy Spirit. But at the end of the day, you're creating uh, an experience, an encounter with God. So if you don't start there, it's really hard to get there at the end. So that's, those are the two reasons why I say, hold off a little bit on those experts. Uh, trust that you are, that you, uh, you have something to say. There's something here that's connecting with you and, uh, and, and trust that that is fundamentally God 
encounter your own encounter with God. Caroline, you also say that a faithful sermon is autobiographical, and I'm so glad that you included this in the book because I think it it's so critical. However, all of us have been in uh, in church and heard a sermon that was a bit cringeworthy, you know, <laughs> when um, either it's like too much information or I'm not your psychiatrist or, you know, mm -hmm. how do we find the balance? You know, Nadia Boltzweber says we should preach from our scars, not our wounds. And I think that's important because we have to be personable to connect with people and we have to share the journey, but to avoid the cringe factor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's your best advice about that? Yeah, that's, uh, we all know those sermons, right? Uh, and and yeah, the TMI, yeah. way too much TMI. Yeah. Uh, I, I always go back to, for particularly for beginning preachers, but even for myself, uh, as I'm preaching, because we've all been in those places, right, where, where this text is speaking to you in such a way that you just like, I, I, I could just put my whole self out there in this. <laughs> But I always come back to something that I talk about in the book, which is the preaching triangle, the rhetorical triangle, that that the that that triangle has, you know, three points as a triangle does. And that's you, the speaker, the preacher, the text, the biblical passage and the congregation. And and we the sermons that are cringeworthy worthy are those that are only a two-way conversation between you and the text. And that pretty much, and that at some point in time also leaves the text behind uh, for the sake of what you are working out or what, you, what you're experiencing in your own life. And so for me, it's always remembering that this is a three-way conversation between you and the text, between you and the text and the congregation. And, 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 in that three-way conversation, and you hope the Holy Spirit is showing up in there somewhere, right? You're praying that the Holy Spirit is, is providing her inspiration in that three-way conversation, in that dialogue. But when you're really, when you're listening to both of them, truly listening to the text and to what your congregation needs to hear, I think that's the, that's the sensory moment where you say, oh, I, they don't need to hear what I'm going through. This is this is not going to be helpful for um, them. And is the text really saying that? Is that really what the text is about? Uh, and so that's that's my that's my number one go to uh, go to technique when it comes to uh, guarding against some of those cringeworthy moments in preaching. So, I'm so glad you included that. And I've been thinking a lot about how this impacts those of us who have begun our preaching journey with our congregations during this time of COVID, you know, where you're sort of speaking into the abyss and a little bit handicapped on that, that mm -hmm. way of knowing, knowing the other people in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Caroline. The, um, I just want to follow up on that in terms of that, I mean, the part about your voice is in that chapter and it goes back to that. Um, when I started, I didn't want to share anything of my story. And yeah. uh, uh, an old uh, retired insurance salesman named Harold, uh, uh, and I, I was uh, visiting with him and his wife and he said, I need to hear more about you. Mm. I need to hear a little bit. He goes, I know why you don't want to do it. But I mean, I think that was really helpful. It helped me find my voice. How much of one story, like you said, you don't wanna, uh, you don't wanna bleed. You're not mm -hmm. there to bleed on people, but you mm -hmm. are there to show them you are a human who's had experiences of God's grace and you know, joy. Well, I always go back to with that. And I talk about this in the book. I always go back to what we could say was the first sermon. Uh, and that's Mary Magdalene, right? She goes to the uh, she goes to the disciples and she says, "I have seen the Lord." And and there is that moment where she is, you know, she is saying something personal, I, but she's making a confession. And then and then that I have seen the Lord also means come and see. So 
that invitation is that it, it is in there as well. And so there is there's something that has to in there there's something that that has to happen in the sermon where there's enough of you for people to say I believe her. I believe him. Like this really matters. This 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 text, this passage, what God is up to really matters to her. Otherwise, it becomes this sort of third person report. Uh, she, it, th this first sermon could have set, could have been Jesus is risen, <laughs> but it's not. It's I have seen the Lord. And so I think that that's holding together a really critical theological aspect of what preaching is about. Uh, that for me also goes back to the incarnation, that, that there's that embodied sense of, 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 of experiencing uh, the risen Christ in our world and in our midst that uh, is a critical aspect of what preaching is all about. Uh, one more question about the book before we just move to a couple of general questions, and that is that you write, a well-placed practice gesture can make a difference because you are then embodying the words you speak. I think new preachers uh, don't necessarily know what to do with their hands. Uh, and so like, uh, <laughs> just grab the pulpit and hold on sort of thing. But For dear life. <laughs> so um, talk more about just gestures and embodiment uh, in preaching. Yeah, it's one of the hardest things, right? We get up there and Amy's nodding, right? And we get up there and yeah, you beginning preaching of holding onto the pulpit for dear life. Uh, and we all know that, you know, with the white knuckles and we all know that feeling, but it, it's hard to know what to do with your body. We're not used to uh, particularly in that kind of uh, space of like, and, and that's so exposed, but I always go back to with my beginning preachers that we are, we communicate with our bodies all the time. Yes. We, we are, how we move about in the world, how we, you know, sit at a coffee shop, even how we move in the grocery store is communicating our mood, how we're feeling. And, and how is it that then we can take that into the pulpit? That, that, that our, our entire body is communicating uh, these words. It's not just what we say, but how we say it. And, we, and that how happens in the language we choose, it happens in the rhetoric, it happens, in, uh, it happens in, in our delivery, but it also happens in our body. And so it, if, uh, if, you know, if this text is really exciting and, and you're making these amazing claims about God and yet you're all hunched over and it, th there, there's a disconnect then between what you are saying and what people feel or what uh, people experience in your bodily gestures. And so it goes back to, it, it goes back to that's part of the how. It's the entirety that, that a sermon is not, uh, a sermon is not a sermon until it is embodied, until it is performed. Otherwise, it's just notes on a page, and uh, and so that and 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 then to help, yeah, help preachers remember that that we're constantly communicating with our bodies. And why is it that that why is it that once we get in the pulpit, that just stops? I was going to say, I'm so glad you you wrote about that, Caroline, because I think as preachers, we learn sometimes about exegesis of a text, and then we learn about maybe a little bit about delivery, but we don't learn the craft of developing a persona, which communicates mm -hmm. so, so powerfully, almost as much or even more than our words. Um, so and, yeah, and yeah. that you bring yourself in there into that space. And we all know also the the phenomenon of someone gets up into the pulpit and they're like a totally different person. Like right. what just happened between, right. <laughs> between this is the way you were in class, or this is how I know you Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. And then you take on this sort of preaching persona that is, that is completely different. And that erodes trust when we, when there is a different, I think when there's a difference uh, that observable difference between how people know you to be and then how you are in the pulpit, then it's like, well, which, which, which Amy is it? Which Rolf is it? hundred percent. hundred percent. My daughter always says, mom, stop it. You're using the pastor Amy voice. Yeah. You know, 
there, there has to be a little difference. I mean, in the sense that you're using your pre, you're using a different voice because you're trying to project to the whole room, mm -hmm. but you can't be fake. So, and that's uh, the, that's the yeah. thing is, yeah. but, the, but you have to show at least not boredom. I know a lot of pastors that get up and they're like teaching me they're bored with their sermon. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so, well, I'm going to be because their body's like, you know, exactly. Yeah. Sunday's always coming like it comes with a relentless rhythm <laughs> any preacher who's writing sermons every week will will know that I think the first time I was preaching every week after about week three I was like all right I already said everything I know everything I learned in seminary I don't know what to do next so tell us what is your tried and true method for getting unstuck when it's the end of the week and you know Sunday's coming mm. my unstuck technique is uh to go back to the text i just i uh, it's that 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 is that's what i'm preaching from that's that's what i'm that's it is something in that text that i am trying to uh to bring to bear on this congregation and so i uh, it and so maybe that's reading it again. Maybe it's listening to it. Maybe it's you know, maybe it's just sitting in it for. Uh, I do, or it, uh, I talk about this in the book, but doing some sort of dislocated exegesis, that will often unstick me. Uh, that rather than uh, listening or reading to the passage in my usual comfy chair or my desk or whatever, that I go to a coffee shop or I go to, uh, you know, I sit on a, you know, sit on a bench by the lake or something like that. And to get out of, you know, to dislocate me um, and take that text into the world, uh, take it into God's world. And what happens when that when that text is where it belongs? Uh, it doesn't belong on my on my desk. It doesn't, um, or you know, wherever I'm usually doing. It belongs in God's world. That that's my tried and true method to get unstuck. What's the hardest sermon you ever preached? Hardest. Oh, hardest you know, I I still go back to. And you'll you'll know this, Rolf. I, I the hardest sermon I ever preached was on my in, was one on my internship, and which was in Mount Vernon, Washington. And it was the Sunday after a, lo a long term, well loved member of the church died, uh, Wendy Johnson, and uh, she was 44 and she died of breast cancer, leaving behind a husband and two young children and uh, two teenage children. And I had gotten to be very good friends with her, very close, visited her on uh, radiation and chemotherapy treatments, took her to appointments. And she, I was engaged. She gave me a wedding shower and, and she died in July uh, and had been diagnosed the August before, and I had to preach the Sunday, the day after her funeral. And that was the hardest because the text was Matthew uh, and of the, um, there, there, you know, my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and I, and what was hard about it was going back to what we talked about, how, how can I not just cry this entire <laughs> this entire sermon? And I uh, and so it, those are the sermons that are probably the most difficult for me when I just I I there is something that has happened in my life that um, that is just so powerfully difficult. And how do I not? <laughs> Uh, how do I then go back to the text and say, but what does this congregation need to hear? Um, and it wasn't, you know, it's, but it's not a funeral sermon. They already heard the funeral sermon the day before and finding, finding in that, finding in that text, this uh, claim of good news that, um, that was, that was just so hard. That was my hardest sermon ever. Mm -hmm. 
Caroline, um, in what ways do you wrestle with the Holy Spirit in your sermon prep? Um, another way of asking that question is, um, talk about how sermon preparation is spiritual discipline for you. Mm. Yeah, for me, I was just uh, talking with a friend of mine about this because I talked to my beginning students, you have to schedule your sermon preparation. You really do. I mean, you have to put it in your calendar. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And, and so that if somebody says to you, you know, Pastor Amy, can you meet on Tuesday morning? But Tuesday morning, you know, but Tuesday morning is your perfect sermon time. You simply say, I have an appointment. I can't, you know. And but I, you know, I would use, I would used to, I used to put on my calendar like, sermon prep, sermon time. And now lately, what I've done is put in my calendar, God. I have an appointment with God, or I have an appointment with the Holy Spirit. And that's really changed then how, how sermon preparation is, is a spiritual discipline, because of this is time with this text where God is going to show up, the spirit is going to speak. And, uh, and it's not sermon study, it's time with God. That's mm -hmm. what really has, has changed and, and made sermon prep less about, less about the study and the work and more about uh, an expected encounter with, with, um, with God that something's going to be revealed you know, something is going to, I'm going to, uh, God is going to reveal something new to me that I've never, uh, I hadn't thought about before. So that's really what's changed it for me. All right. So uh, I, I want to take advantage of Amy's presence with us here. So I'm going to ask Amy, um, you a question that I'll answer first to give you just a minute, which is, so what's your best piece of advice for new preachers? And I'll give mine first to give you a minute to think, which is, um, do what you're best at in your preaching. Don't try to be what you're worst at. So after you've preached for a while, say, talk to some of the people, listen, what do I do best in my preaching? And then do that because you're never going to get good at what you're bad at. That's, there's a reason you're bad at it. It's because <laughs> that's not you, you know? And so do what you're best at and ask folks, um, what that is. If you don't already know, what's your, uh, one piece of advice for new preachers, Amy? Ooh, that's good advice because the minute you step up there and try to act like someone you're not, ooh, everything falls flat. Uh, for me, it's always, always go back to the text. Always go back to the text. The text is your anchor and that's where you start and that's where you touch on when you don't know where you're going and that's where you end. Um, that to me is always given um, the assurance that this is not like the Amy show right? Mm -hmm. The text gives us that um, insurance. And I think you can't go wrong if you're sticking very closely to the text. All right. Well, we're going to uh, wind up with the, our, uh, our grand finale. That Bandit the Podcast has a few questions he'd like to ask. Yay. Right. I love Bandit. Bandit asks, what is your favorite animal and why is it a cat? <laughs> I love asking this question of others and I'm glad I got asked it. Uh, well, I do really, really like cats, actually. I do very much like cats. But I think that if I had to pick, it'd be a, hor it'd be a horse. I had such a horse thing when I was in junior high, like loved horses, took riding lessons. I love horses. I love, I love the strength of them. I love, I love riding them. I love, yeah. So it's a horse. All right. Bandit also wants to know what's your favorite kind of bird? Well, I love birds. I guess maybe is a bird, bird a, a, yeah, a bird is, is a bird an animal? Is it considered an animal? Yes. I, yes. Maybe I could have said a bird, but I really like horses. All right. Bird, my favorite bird. Well, lately, my favorite bird has been a cardinal uh, because my mom died uh, about a year and a half ago. And you probably know the 
the spirituality around a cardinal that uh, if you see a cardinal, cardinal, that is your loved one trying to connect with you uh, and getting your attention. So lately it's been a cardinal, but I like all birds. Bandit wonders, what's the weirdest place you've ever taken a nap? Uh, it's not really that weird. Uh, it, it's not really that weird. It, it's more of like a general napping thing. I can sleep on an airplane like I, it's, it's there's something about like the 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 constancy of the hum and the and the air or whatever going like as soon as I get on an airplane I'm like asleep nice I know wow all right well Bennett also wants to know if the serpent in Genesis gets too much credit for the fall or should we blame it all on Eve as is rightly appropriate I think we should um, always blame it all on Adam. Uh, <laughs> I think it's really at the end of the day, Adam's fault. So that's, that's my, that's my go-to interpretation of Genesis three. It's all Adam, all Adam's fault. Well, I want to say um, lay preachers guide. It's not just for lay preachers. I uh -oh. think, I think any preacher I learned from this book, I'm sure Amy did too. Uh, it's a valuable book, um, and but not only can uh, law seminary graduated, seminary educated, and long time preachers learn from it, but they might want to keep it on hand uh, to to um, give to to share with other folks uh, who might uh, be called to preaching. You might even give it to somebody to, uh, if they're thinking about seminary because it might help uh, them discern different things. So thanks for listening to this episode of Working Preacher Books podcast. Uh, stay up to date on our conversation at workingpreacher.org. Follow us on Twitter or Facebook and find the latest in our Working Preacher book series at workingpreacher.org slash books. Thank you, Amy, for being with us uh, for this. Uh, thanks, Caroline, for writing a fantastic book and giving us an occasion to have this conversation.